Let us now welcome back Senior Director, Prog Product Marketing Platform, Red Hat Inc., Mr. Mark Coggan, once again, as he touches on RHEL 7 Atomic Host and Containers. Mr. Coggan, take it away. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks, Chris, as well. Uh, great, great presentation, I think starting to knit together the, the portfolio of, you know, again, of infrastructure solutions from Red Hat, but also how you manage them uh, in a way that makes a lot of sense for you as customers who have very disparate uh, sets of technologies, but unifying them together into what we refer to as the open hybrid cloud. So what I'm going to talk about for the next 30 minutes is a kind of an emerging area for Red Hat, and one that I think is starting to um, really take storm and interest in the industry, and that is the area of Linux containers, application containers, and we're referring to this as applications on the move, um, and I'm going to talk about a lot of different trends and things happening in this particular space and give you a little bit more insight into what Red Hat is doing. So to recap on some of the IT concerns that we hear from customers, you know, of course, how do, how do customers maintain um, you know, the responsiveness to the line of business and, and what is, again, increasingly intense and rapid fire uh, requirements from the line of business to deliver new services, to uh, increase capacity and resources available, to do things quicker and faster, um, whether it has to do with acquisitions or new lines of business being launched. Lots of requirements that the IT organization is, to, is responding to from the line of business. Of course, the reality is they are being asked to do this with existing resources. Um, do it efficiently, do it, you know, trying to drive costs down, but fundamentally, as Chris mentioned, budgets aren't really being raised, so you have to fit things into the budgets you have. Keeping the lights on, um, and the only way to really get money allocated for new innovative things is if you can somehow drive costs down and be more efficient. Now, while you still are doing all of these things, there, there still remain the table stakes, we call them, of keeping the enterprise secure. You know, you still have to deliver those, those critical securing the data, um, securing and uh, delivering privacy, um, and, and securing and delivering uh, the, the, the applications that are accessible to your business. So this, this whole set of priorities, though, also can be represented as a set of IT challenges that uh, present themselves in a cycle. So first, you know, the, the reality for many of you is that you end up uh, today inheriting and managing legacy infrastructure that is inflexible, rigid, and, and challenging to, uh, to modify, to challenging to adapt and, and to take forward into the future. Now, the, the byproduct of that inefficient infrastructure is that you're able, you're, you're resulting in having to support, maintain this with additional staff, in some cases skills that are hard to find because many of these systems represent um, either applications or, or technologies that are five, eight, ten years old. Again, very often to find staff to maintain and support this. So you end up with inefficient operations. You end up also, though, being, doing this in a way that maintains the status quo. You're kind of stuck. You know, you're, you're keeping the lights on. You're unable to break free of the cycle because you're stuck with the staff requirements, with the budgets you've been allocated. And the reality, as I mentioned earlier, is with all of this now, the cycle means you have less time to innovate. So as the business wants you to be more innovative, to deliver those new services and capabilities to align to the business strategy, to transform the business through the transformation of IT, you're actually struggling to do that because you don't have the time or the budget to innovate. So how do you break through and break free of this virtuous cycle that, that creates a very difficult spiral that you're all stuck in? Well, we think that one of the ways to do this is to, is to evaluate the capabilities that we believe will come with the advent of Linux containers and application containers. And we think that what's going to happen through this new set of technologies is that it will allow you to transform the way you deliver applications to the business, 
You will be able to create new classes of applications. You will able, be able to innovate. And in a way, that's going to start to break that cycle that I talked about on the previous slide. So what are some of the benefits of Linux containers? First, they will allow you to, be, um, to achieve deployment flexibility. So we're going to go into some detail on the packaging concepts behind what is a container, what is the, the host environment, and what that all looks like. But fundamentally, what it will allow you to do is achieve deployment flexibility across physical, virtual, private, and public cloud resources, using these containers as the portable vehicle to achieve that. Second, through concepts of uh, development ops or DevOps integration um, and this new trend, you're going to be able to achieve uh, application delivery much faster. And we'll explain why. Third, you'll do things more efficiently. The containers themselves will represent um, a set of technologies and packaged in a way that makes the deployment, the provisioning, the management and maintenance of these uh, container containerized applications and the hosts themselves much more easy and more efficient for you as an organization. And ultimately, this all results in lower deployment costs for you as an organization. And as you can see, several of these will drive the freedom of resource and of budget, allowing you to then embark on new areas of innovation for your business. So let's talk for a moment about what Linux containers are. The way I like to describe them is that they are fundamentally uh, taking the existing operating system, splitting it into two pieces. One piece ends up being packaged as the host operating system, this gray box on the bottom. The host operating system is a lightweight, minimal footprint operating system that brings in only the core pieces needed to run applications. It's the kernel. It's several other packages that we'll talk about in a minute. The second area you're now splitting is you're taking pieces of the operating system into the container itself. And this container is the application as well as the dependencies that that application has to run. The libraries, the runtimes, the specific user space packages that the application needs. Now, you're, so you're splitting these two pieces in in what is from a large uh, set of capabilities and, and packages in the, in the traditional distribution or operating system, you're, you're really stri streamlining this down to a minimal set of core things. And by doing this, and by doing this, you're able to then make it more portable, more easy to deploy, and of course, easier to maintain and keep secure. And we'll talk about all of this in a bit. But this is fundamentally what the container is and how it runs. You see a picture on, on the uh, slide here of a logo from a company called Docker. Can I see a show of hands for how many people have heard of Docker? OK, so a fair number of you. Docker is a company that we're partnering with. Docker is many things. It's a company. It's a, uh, an upstream open source project. It's a packaging format. Um, and it's a tool. The tool itself ships with Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, and it's integral to how um, the container is built, the format in which the container is constructed, uh, the metadata around that container, as well as how you instantiate and uh, basically bring the container up on top of a host. So this, this is a company that we are working with closely. Um, they're somewhat a visionary in the field, but we're, they're an integral partner of Red Hat's in, in how we move forward. So let's talk for a moment about comparing virtualization to containers, because that's a logical question from, from people. They say, well, this really looks like virtualization. You know, you're isolating an application. You're standing up multiple instances of this on a single piece of hardware. Um, looks like virtualization to me. And by very simple contrasts and, com and comparisons, it is similar. But there are some distinctions that are worth describing here. So I'm going to describe on the left here what virtualization is. So virtualization is still you know, on top of a set of hardware. You're running a hypervisor either on top of a host operating system or even without a host operating system, depending on whether it's a type 1 or type 2 hypervisor. And then on top of that operating system and, and, and resource manager, you're now running multiple virtual machines. Each virtual machine 
has its own guest operating system. Each virtual machine has its own set of libraries and dependencies, as well as an application to run, um, at least one application. So you're, you're seeing now a, very, a fairly heavyweight stack being built up on top of uh, the core hardware platform in a virtualization model. This, of course, is part of the, you know, the, the descriptions we've been dis giving you around traditional applications, um, how they're managed, how they're, how they're you know, developed in a way that allows for shared resource pools, but also how they're, provided, uh, they're providing security and isolation. So this has been the traditional way to do, to do this. Now on the right, you see containerization as a trend. Contra containerization um, really streamlines the number of things you need to run multiple applications on a, a core piece of hardware. And you do that through a host operating system, a single, by the way, single host operating system on top of the hardware. And then on top of that, multiple applications um, being run as their own container, each container containing the core dependencies required to run that application. So it may be glibc, it may be Python, it may be other particular runtime, uh, uh, runtime dependencies, but really each container is, is minimally constrained to what is needed to run that app. And the host itself is also constrained. So it's a much lighter weight uh, version, simple version of application packaging. Each container can be unique. Each container can be um, stateless. You know, you get a lot of the benefits of these cloud-enabled applications that we've been talking about, um, quickly provisioning things up, uh, decommissioning them as well. It, it lends itself nicely to a scale-out architecture. So let's look at how you know, quickly and how operational efficiency gets driven in the model of containerization. This is a chart you saw this morning from Brian Shea when he talked about uh, some of the initiatives we're undertaking. Deploying a physical server um, from kind of request to um, kind of being available can take, on average, 27 hours. And this is, by the way, data that's, that comes from industry research. But it's a very typical answer. In fact, uh, some would argue that 27 hours is actually a very good service level for delivering a new physical server. Some companies may take days or weeks. But typically, 27 hours is the, the industry average that we, we see. To, to stand up and deploy a virtual machine and, and set this up is about 12 minutes. Much quicker compared to a physical server. Um, certainly driving things in the right direction, but you know, still you know, several minutes to get this set up and running. Comparing finally to the, the notion of a container, creating and setting up a container takes about 10 seconds. So you can now see how quickly you can provision, set up, and deploy, and, and scale out the, this new application architecture based on containers. Now let's talk about density. Another benefit that we, the, we will see in terms of you know, dense applications on top of um, you know, servers, hardware, uh, and that container host that we talked about. Typically, the, the industry averages are eight to 10 virtual machines per server. And that's, again, another industry number that is very well understood. Comparing that to the density you can get for containers on the same style class of server, you can get um, 100 containers. So you're getting an order of magnitude improvement in density containers compared to virtual machines. Now let's look at performance. Some of the initial numbers that we've run in our labs talk comparing performance of a particular set of container applications in a, a container versus running on the bare metal machine for Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7. That's what these benchmarks are. Several, three benchmarks, a calculation, compute benchmark, an OLTP workload, and an analytics application. And I will point out one subtlety. These benchmarks were actually not run on an optimized container host. They were actually run on uh, full Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, the fully featured operating system. So we think that the benefits may improve um, as, we, as we unveil the offering that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But you can see here the, the bare metal performance 
being um, kind of peaked at 100%, so full, full on bare metal performance, and then looking at the degradation in performance when you stand up and run this in a container. And you see for the compute benchmark, the same performance level is achieved. For the OLTP workload, you're seeing 97% performance levels. And for the BI analytics application, you're seeing 94%. So nearly bare metal performance, therefore showing very little overhead and degradation due to the containers themselves. And now let's, let's take another view of the earlier chart on how quickly it is to set up and deploy containers. This chart shows over a period of 13 seconds, um, you know, kind of how many VMs versus containers can get uh, run and started and run. And in that 13 seconds, that's what it takes to get one virtual machine up and running. But in that same period, you're able to get 65 containers set up and, and running. So again, creation speed, um, operational efficiency, very high. So let's explain and dive into a little bit about um, why this also drives some operational efficiencies from a, an overall performance of the IT organization. This is a, you know, a way that we believe containerization brings to life the concepts and notion of DevOps. DevOps, continuous integration, continuous delivery. In this model, yeah, and let me, actually let me talk about the old world, the old model for a moment. The old world five, ten years ago was such that there were two teams that existed and they didn't talk to one another. There was the applications team or the development team and there was the operations or infrastructure team. And we had, in the US we have this term called throw it over the wall. So the application team would develop an application or procure it perhaps from a third party ISV and they would get this in house and they would throw it over to the operations team and say here's the application we need this to be you know provisioned run managed and, and maintained this um, this was a very much again a, a, an example of two groups that didn't talk to each other um, they didn't set requirements effectively they didn't communicate the operations team would inherit this application and have to figure out what, okay, what's the, the sizing of, you know, how many servers do I need? How do I architect this? How do I deploy instances globally? Um, you know, network storage, you know, sizing the whole architecture around it. So it was a very um, complicated, um, inefficient process for how this, this worked. Very inefficient and bad for the, the customer experience in the, in the business who used these applications if you were the factory um, who depended on you know having SAP R3 implemented you know you were dealing you were watching this unfold over the period of six months or maybe even a year uh, before you got your application up and running so it was very frustrating for the customers inside of the company who needed this application so fast forward to today the the, the words that we were all talking about DevOps and what, what we believe containers help provide is much more clean delineation between what the application team is responsible for and what the infrastructure team is responsible for, but also a way of having those, those two groups communicate more effectively together. So in this example, the development team you know, decides that you know, there's a request from the business to develop a new piece of um, application functionality. They begin doing that. They code it. They, um, they build it, they test it, and they also, in, in the process of that, incorporate into the container those key dependencies that are required. Um, it may be a database, it may be some user space packages, but it certainly will be the application uh, runtimes, the libraries that the, the application needs to run. So that definition happens. Then the operation team knows that they're responsible for provisioning and managing the hardware and the core operating system on top of it. And as long as that application has been certified against the host operating system, that container has been certified against the host operating system, they're happy. They know that by, you know, the, the application team will be responsible for it if, if updates are made to the, the, you know, the Python application and, and requires a new Python runtime. The application team will be responsible for that. In the old world, if the application team made changes to the Python app, 
they would have to tell the operations team, hey, we just, by the way, we just implemented this new, um, this new library, and it, you need to update the Python runtime to version 3.6.3 because 3.6.2 doesn't work anymore. So it was a very inefficient process. So again, now responsibilities are well-defined. These groups can work more effectively together, and the end result being a much more efficient process. So you're probably all wondering why I have a picture of a faucet and, and reference to drinking water specifications on this chart. Um, and it's gonna, I'm going to use this to talk a little bit about the question of, you know, are containers safe? Are they secure? Should I care about certification? Should I care about standards? And the answer is you should. So just like you wouldn't drink water from a source that you didn't understand where the, the water came from, that you, didn't, uh, you wouldn't drink water that wasn't tested against certain industry standards. You probably wouldn't drink water that came through pipes that weren't made um, you know, against certain industry specifications, or faucets that weren't made in factories that adhere to ISO 9000 manufacturing standards. Well, we believe that same model for drinking water, and by the way, the, the other piece of this story is that drinking water is very, you know, it's very much well accepted. It's just, it's there, it's a utility. You don't think about it, you take it for granted. Well, we, we think that the operating system has also become a similar, um, similar thing. Something that is there, it works, it's trusted, people don't think about it because it's always functioning and functioning well. Well, what we're here to tell you though is that in the world of containers, the certification does matter. You do need to know that your container will, you know, you need to know where it came from, who built it, the pieces that are included, has it been tested. You need to know that it, it can run on a particular version of a container host. You need to know that they've been also tested and certified, that there's a chain of trust there, um, and that someone is there to support you. So this is the model that really Red Hat embraces. And it's, it's integral to the model that we talked about earlier today with Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack platform with all of our products is the level of enterprise hardening, testing, certification, as well as working with a third party um, ecosystem is really integral to the way we operate as a company and also carries forward in the approach we will take with containers. We believe you need to make sure that the, the container itself is from a trusted, source, that it's secure, signed, and that it runs on a host operating system that also adheres to the same level of testing, certification, and standards. One proof point to share with you um, is OpenShift. Uh, for those of you who were, were in the, the other track, track B, learning a little bit more from Krish about Red Hat, uh, uh, OpenShift. OpenShift is our platform as a service offering. Again, you heard us mention this throughout the presentations this morning as well. Red Hat OpenShift is our platform as a service offering, and it's built on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux and embraces the notion of Linux containers in the way that the application functionality called gears are delivered. So this, you know, fundamentally, you, you've, we've been working on this for several years. It's up and running. It's a very valid, valid proof point for this approach. And it will also continue to be part of our vision of how containers get ultimately delivered as a portable, uh, a portable application delivery vehicle. One of, the, um, one of the specific areas we're working on is, a, is a, a new product offering called Red Hat Enterprise Linux Atomic Host. You saw us announce this at Red Hat Summit in April. And at that time, what we were doing is really making available a, a pre-beta uh, version of this to a select number of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 beta customers to do very early stage testing. And we continue through that testing as we speak today. But our intent is to then take this into a full public beta later this year. And what Red Hat Enterprise Linux Atomic Host is, is that minimal footprint, container optimized, um, host operating system. It is just the core requirements and capabilities to run application containers. It's the Linux kernel. 
It's C groups for resource management, SE Linux and SVIRT secure, for security, System D for process management. It's um, kernel namespaces for the process isolation that's required. But this, this is really the, the definition of what the atomic host is. It also allows much more simple maintenance through uh, a new packaging de deployment methodology called OS tree that allows you to update and deploy, but also roll back technology pieces only at the very granular level without disruption to the overall operation of the host environment. So simplified maintenance. But ultimately, it, it inherits all of these technologies from Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So it's, it is enterprise grade, it's tested, it's certified, and it also supports and delivers with it the full ecosystem that Red Hat delivers. So look, you know, watch for more of this later this year. Uh, stay tuned to it. It's, it's a very exciting area for, for Red Hat, and will we'll be you know, effectively our optimized uh, container host offering to run application containers. I think I've talked about this quite a bit already. Um, the thing I will still uh, maybe add to this story is the mention of Docker. Again, Docker being the tool that exists inside of the RHEL Atomic Host, but also the tool that is used to build and construct the containers themselves. Another thing to talk about here is, is that the containers, um, application containers, we believe, will also create a new class of applications. It will create the notion of being able to construct and build composite applications integrated and woven together um, yeah, as a set of microservices and delivered you know, with, again, new, new, a new vision of functionality that can be thought of. So you can imag imagine a, a financial services firm that wants to develop a um, set of trading applications for their, for their traders. They may have a back-end market data system that ties into um, some data feeds. They may have a front-end web interface for their traders. A lot of other pieces, maybe trade settlement. Uh, so all of these can be viewed as individual pieces of container functionality. But think in the middle of this, this suite of the trading application. Think in the middle of it is a core set of quantitative trading algorithms. And this is the core competitive advantage for this financial services company. Now, they want to change. They want to be able to change functionality out you know, every you know, day or every week. They want to try new algorithms. They want to test. They want to do A-B testing. They want to keep ahead of their competition. So in this composite um, application architecture that I've described, this container can get literally swapped in and out very easily. And you, you'll envision a new set of these microservices being deployed that can embrace this, this whole concept. So that's, that's one of the important takeaways from this containerization initiative. Another thing I want to leave you with, though, is that to do this will require a level of sophistication for con content management of the container, of the host operating system. We will emb embark on this you know, by leveraging the, the management products that we have in our portfolio that Chris talked about earlier with cloud forms and satellite. But we'll also um, embark on initiatives to, to orchestrate the containers. Orchestrating these containers across shared resource pools, across clusters, and to, to do this and achieve this, we're working with Google on a project called Kubernetes. We've achieved committer status with Kubernetes, uh, working with Google and many other companies, and it's an important initiative of how we aspire to deliver full functionality for this initiative to the customer. So the container host, in the form of Red Hat Enterprise Linux Atomic Host, the tools to build and develop the containers themselves, the management products with cloud forms and satellite required to um, update the content of both the, the container itself as well as the host, and then finally, Kubernetes and other tools required to orchestrate these containers across uh, multiple nodes and shared resource pools. So that's our, that's our vision of containerization but ultimately delivering against the hybrid cloud, the open hybrid cloud, where we think containers will now be able to easily be moved from physical to virtual to private cloud in things like RHEL OpenStack platform to even the public cloud um, with our partners in CCP, uh, our certified cloud provider program. This is, containers bring to life, we believe, the notion of true application portability for the enterprise. 
A couple of proof points from uh, observations from, from an industry analyst as well as from a, a customer, um, as well as another, actually another industry analyst in a research report published in May, you know, that, that we, you know, we will lead, we will provide thought leadership um, just the way we did with Linux, we will apply the same approach and leadership into the containerization space and uh, just validation of our, of our work um, from a couple of analysts, as well as endorsement of the fact that in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, we delivered this technology and several customers, including NTT cited here, are seeing value in being able to now use this technology with Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7. To learn more, uh, Follow us on our blog, the you know, relblog.redhat.com, and there are multiple blog posts around this, this topic um, that you should stay in touch with and follow it. There's a, a Project Atomic is our open source project where we are developing and, and leading tool development for companies to develop um, their own, effectively their own atomic host. Um, so the tools required to develop those optimized container hosts but again, upstream open source community led by Red Hat. And then, of course, the, the full announcement that we made at Red Hat Summit in April uh, can be found at this, this uh, news post here where we talk about what we're doing with Docker, what we're doing with Rel Atomic Host, some upstream projects like Project Atomic and Gear D, as well as um, our plans and vision for develop, delivering a certified ecosystem for containerization technology. So with that, I want to thank you. And uh, again, enjoy the rest of the afternoon and, and look forward to talking with you. Thank you, Mr. Coggins.